Well, good evening everyone. I uh, hope you're all ready for this evening's live stream. I've been doing a little bit of work, as you can see. This is the second stall. So I've made some progress on that since we last met. And I've got the last bit of joinery, um, which is this half joint into the legs and the stretcher. So I'll be showing you that this evening. I've actually got my second one glued up and so there should be pictures of that coming out very soon and um, well hopefully it'll be good fun and I'll show you the little trick which all being well will work with them so let's get cracking don't forget I've uh, got Bench Talk 101 on tomorrow night uh, check them out on YouTube and Instagram for the links to get into the the zoom call and I'll try and mention that later on as well. And somewhere on here is my ugly mug. So I'm keeping a look at the chat as well, or at least I will be a little later on. And we're very lucky to have Shrenik moderating again the chat. So any questions you put in there uh, that aren't rude, then he'll be able to repeat to me so I can hear what's going on. So let's get cracking. So I've laid out on the bench here the pieces for the second set of legs. So the two legs and the stretcher. I've cut one of the half joints here and the idea is to cut half the material away from the one piece and a, a suitable sized recess in the other and then they go together like so. And so what I'm going to be doing this evening is cutting the one for this corner. Now first of all I'm going to cut half the material away from the stretcher and I got a bit carried away when I was doing the other ones and I've already marked it out. So I'll go through showing you how I mark it out uh, so just bear in mind that those marks are already on there. The first thing I did was from my plans I knew how far apart the legs wanted to be and that's how I actually ended up doing the mortises in the top of the stool and so that set the distance between the legs that's what I set out in the middle of my stock here uh, that happened to be 505 mil uh, then I marked the ends of the 505 mil at both ends leaving enough room for the legs so that's the point we got up to square those lines off remove that half and that's what I'm doing at this end. So at the width of the legs square the line off then I carried that round onto the edge and you can see this is one of the boards that I had to get out of a pallet so we've got a lot of nail holes in it. Squared that line onto the other edge and then normally you'd use something like a, a marking gauge, something like this, to mark the um, depth of cut. And you always do that from the show side, so that you know how much material is going to be set into the, into the legs. So I'll set that pin up and I would scribe like so. But when I actually clean this joint out, um, I'm lucky enough to have a router plane. So I've actually set that up for the right dimension and I'll just use that as my gauge. So that's been scribed across like so. Also scribe it on the end and on the reverse side. So basically that's marked out the whole of the cut I need to make. The next thing to do, just in case you get called away, is to mark on there which bit actually is your waist because I can tell you I have actually cut away the wrong piece when I've gone back to something that I've left overnight now I scored that line in quite deep because what I want to do is uh, give myself a little knifed wall just to help me start my saw cut accurately So I'll just 
just push the chisel down, bear into it, into the bottom of that knife cup, and then that flakes out. Like so. That just gives a very small shoulder, which is uh, enough to hold the saw and stop it from sliding in, into your work. Now I'm using Japanese saws tonight, so I'll just use these to, as a bench hook, like so. Line the saw up against the, that knife's wall, and I, I start by dragging a couple of times. That sets me a good curve from which to start sawing properly. I'm not putting any pressure on the saw, it's just the weight of the saw and, uh, and the weight of my hand, that's all. See down to the bottom, so I just rotate it a little bit. Down to the gauge mark. Same on the back side. And then take out the triangle that's left in the middle. you end up with a lump in the middle so just using the toe of the saw with those blades in the middle holding the the heel up a bit just score a bit more in the middle just a little bit I've got two options now I can either chop that into the end grain and hope that it comes away nicely and actually looking at, at the grain on there it's reasonably straight, it probably would chop okay. But I think I did that in uh, one of the last two streams. So I've shown that method. This time I'm going to saw it. Japanese saw again. And it's the same sort of thing. I'm going to start the saw, get a very slight curve in here. Then I'm going to saw down the front edge, keeping the saw in the curve at the top. Go around the other side, start there, and then finish it off. So I'm just getting my curve in. So Mitch, do you find it easier to cut tenons with a Japanese saw? Or is that just, uh, you're just using it because of your hands? Um, I find it about, probably about the same to be honest with you. Uh, the, the Japanese saws do work really nicely in this uh, very light wood that comes out of the pallets. Not quite sure what it is. It might be spruce. Notice when I was doing the other ends of the, the other stretcher and, and this one as well that the, uh, the grain, although it looks quite straight uh, inside, it can be quite, quite complicated. That's probably why they've used it in a pallet. So, even though you're using a, a pull saw which is supposed to tension it nicely, it doesn't always go perfectly straight through the wood. thing about a Japanese saw and doing this upright in the vice is that uh, I can still operate the saw 
holding the handle perhaps at the top or right at the end and I don't have to keep moving the wood. Another question that uh, people ask is which do you cut first, the cheek cut or the shoulder cut? And, uh, it doesn't really matter as long as you match up and you don't go too far with it. But the one not to go too far with really is the uh, this shoulder cut because then you're if you go into what's left you're weakening it. So now I'm coming down to where that shoulder cut is. I'd rather not go further than it is, but it's less important. So then go back to my cross cut saw. And I don't, you probably can't hear, there's a definite difference when you come up to the last few uh, fibres. So you can slow down so you don't cut too far. That actually looks pretty clean. Certainly better than the last cut I did. But I mentioned I had uh, the router plane set up. So just holding that down on the the front surface, what's going to be the front surface in the bench. Hold this handle down and just moving this one backwards and forwards lightly as well because you're hanging off this surface here you could do too much pressure it will wobble around so plenty of pressure on on this handle but as for cutting just take it lightly if you've got a lot of material left then it's best to remove it with a paring chisel closer to the final thickness and then come in with the router plane from both sides there just so that I'm not shooting over the edge and maybe tearing some material out. Do you find it easier to use a router plane pulling towards you or pushing away from you? Hadn't really thought about that to be honest. I always do it both ways because of working from both sides uh, rather than changing the material uh, rather than swapping the direction of the material around I suppose I, I always find it easier to control pulling towards me than pushing because you can also see where you're working I mean I, I use it both ways but if you're pulling towards you it's easier to see where you're working if you're not directly over the top of it are you using uh, one of these Stanley 71s or 72, is it? Uh, I've used a record, uh, well, I've got a record and I've got a Veritas as well. They're yeah. both, I mean, it does the same thing. I find I can see through the throat here quite clearly. Uh, it does depend where I'm standing. If I stand over it like I'm doing here, I can see straight down and see the end of the cutter. And I can see it sort of both ways round. But that's what I'm saying, if you're not looking directly over the top, no, if you're not looking over the top or if you're in the wrong position, it can be uh, quite awkward to see what you're doing. Yeah. Another thing you can do with these um, when you're doing tenons is to put a sub base on it. So extend out um, the base on the side that's resting on the, your reference surface. And so you can be holding out here, get lots of leverage down on, on the work. And that stops you tipping over like that. Have you seen the Edward Preston router plates where you can actually take off the knob and put the cutter in the position of the knob? 
And I've that not... gives you more surface area when you're using it for tents and so on. I don't think I've seen that really. I have got a little little tab down there that needs cutting off. So just a bit of pressure down on the chisel. Just sneak that little bit out. I don't want to make this sound too complicated because if you're new to woodworking, you want to make one of these mortising stools, definitely make one. You don't need to be really accurate with your joinery. You can make a, a really decent stool, um, even quite roughly, and it'll, it'll work for you really well. But just because I do a lot of fine work, when I, when I start making something, I tend to make too much of a meal of it and making it really, really sweet. Okay, so that bit's done. Let's lay the legs back out again. We need to make the, the mating mortise for that. Now, the two ways of doing this, I could measure down the leg here and find the point where I'm going to start. Um, but seeing as I've done it on the other leg and I want it to, to be parallel with the top, let's put those two legs together. Let's make sure they're lined up. And I can simply transfer the mark out, the mark out for one end of it and I'm going to be the top end of it. To transfer the top and these are quite difficult to mark out on here and um, chase the line around the corners because this studding has actually got rounded corners on it and I haven't um, dressed it down although I have planed it a little bit I haven't dressed it so far as to take those rounded corners off so I've got my top line now I'll use the actual wood itself. So I'll lay the joint on there. And I'll push it up to that line. So I'll use it, do it, do it in the proper way. Use the square, put the square on the line. Using the knife to reference it. Then move the workpiece over up to the square, hold it down nice and tight, and put a mark on the other side. So I think I was talking last time about measuring less um, with you know a ruler or, or calipers or things like that. Use direct measurements from the workpieces, and you've got one less chance of making an error. And I use the square to mark that across. Mitch Paul's asking, would you recommend removing the rounded corners? Um, would I remove the rounded corners? If I was really fussed about getting absolutely lovely tight perfectly fitting joints without any slight gap or without it being slightly tight to, to put home, to push home, then, then yes, it would be better. You, you'd be able to square your lines around fractionally more accurately, I think. But for this, for this job, I wasn't tempted. So rather than marking too far down the sides, if I just put a pencil roughly where the ends are, Use the router plane. It's actually a really good gauge, a router plane. And if you put a full base on it with just the blade sticking out, really, really excellent. But you can imagine you're using the equivalent of a plane blade as your scoring knife. Really lovely. So I'll do that on both sides. And I know 
streaming, you won't see how clear that is, but it really is much better than using a, a marking gauge. It's so much so, so, so nice it is, I can't see it um, when I'm sawing and looking down on the work, so I'll put a pencil line through there. But that's probably more to do with my eyesight than anything else. So that's what we're going to remove. Do we have uh, most of the regulars in tonight? be doing something right if you keep coming back. Okay, so Lego Man's asking, have you flattened the stock? He said he's personally never seen a piece of construction lumber or timber that wasn't twisted. Uh, yes, it, it was twisted. One piece was actually r really good. I think, I think the first piece was really good, or, or this piece was really good. Um, not perfect, but um, certainly better than you'd expect. Um, but yes, I did. I cut it down into its lengths, the leg lengths, which is the only things I made from the study in, in this instance. Cut it down to that length, and then of course it's much easier on, on a shorter length to take out any twist in it. You didn't buy it from B and Q, did you? Because B and Q are only stuck. Stock uh, banana wood. I, I bought it from Wix. I, I think are they the same company? Uh, I don't think so. I think you've completely missed my joke, though. <laughs> very, very good. Banana tree. All the from, uh, all the, uh, all the wood from B and Q is pretty much banana shaped. <laughs> There's nothing straight in there. That's very good. Alright, let's see if we can get this sawn without any problems. I've gone back to a, a rougher cross cut saw for this, just to show you that you don't need two separate saws, you can just get one, get yourself started. The, uh, the main strength, to be honest, in this store is going to be the um, long grain to long grain glue joints. Which this is one of. Which this is one of, yeah. And although, yeah. obviously, one, one might say, well, it's cross grain situation, but we're only talking about, what, two and a half inches, so there's not going to be so much movement in those pieces of that um, PVA joint, which is, I think, always very slightly flexible anyway. I don't think that's going to ever be a problem. Yeah. If you Just want the, um, if you wanted the mechanical advantage of a dovetail in this situation, 
So cutting a dovetail here. Uh, and if you did it as a, uh, as a halved dovetail joint, it, it would look nice, nice design feature. But if you want the same sort of strength from it pulling apart like this, uh, you could simply put a, a dovetail, uh, not a dovetail, a dowel or a couple of dowels through the joint from the front, or even from hidden ones from behind. Uh, Paul's asking if you're liking the warmer workshop. I'm loving the warmer workshop. There's less light. Um, I've got loads of lights on this evening. And actually I should have this light on over here. Make it even better. Are you, are you going to rig up some new lights? Uh, well, I will definitely rig up some floodlights. Uh, at the moment, um, they're quite directional, which is not great. But it must be easy to control the light, I think, for photography, especially for filming. So what was that, Trinit? Paul's uh, saying that it must be easier to control the lighting. It must be uh, with, uh, with your filming, for sure. Uh, it is, but the main advantage really for lighting in here is there's space to, to put the lights where I want them rather than trying to crowd them into the, the tighter workshop. So I'm just putting in some relief cuts here for when I remove the bulk of this material. So they're just cuts through the waste. chisel uh, and one thing that, that does happen with this lumber is you can be very careful about chopping and you'll find the whole bit comes out in one section rather than slowly and of course then you've got the chance that you might tear off more material than you than you want to so take it very gently actually do it slightly diagonally like so See that clearer from above, so that the the pressure of the chisel is going sort of with the grain rather than straight across. Certainly not conventional. In fact, it served me right if it went wrong tonight, wouldn't it? follow the chisel through here, if I don't move, it goes straight past me so I'm, although it's in my general direction it's not going to hit me if, it, uh, if I let go of it. What you should never do is do that because that could be very painful. How are you finding this time slot? This time slot is definitely working better for me and the afternoon one drew in some other people which was nice so maybe having an afternoon and an evening one. Twenty or so people watching. Uh, don't you know? Don't be afraid to pop up in the chat and 
ask questions. I'll read them out to Mitch if you've got any. Probably all listening to the, the football on the radio and just having this on in the background. There's certainly an argument that you could uh, you could use a rasp and a file to get there as quick as you can with a chisel. So let's see uh, how close it is to the router plane depth. Wonderful. So it's just taking a very fine shaving near the edges. Hello to Cloudy. Can you see how fine those shavings are? Um, Tom E four K K K K. He's he's asking. He's saying that he's having problems sourcing a two forty Dozuki saw off a reputable brand. He really wants another Gaokuchu saw. Um, to his Ryoba, also his, also uh, by Goad Kutru. Yeah, it's difficult to pronounce, isn't it? I'll yeah. have to look at it when I say it. Kakuchimu. And he's having trouble finding a 240. Yeah. Has he tried um, Workshop Heaven? Recently, there's been a lot of talk of uh, moistening end grain. Well, I've seen someone use METS. I've seen someone attempt to use white spirit, but it didn't work very well. And I've seen people, well, Japanese people, use water. And I think water works well enough. Yeah. I've, I've used water uh, on this 
I'll show you in a minute what I did. Um, so that's that joint done. I'm, I'm pleased with that. It's nice and tight. Or say tight. I managed to push it in and I can pull it out so it's snug I should say. So I put that with the other one. And that's pretty much completed what I was going to do uh, this evening. But I will show you, since we're quite early on still, um, what I've tidied up on the other pieces is I've tidied the foot, the foot up, which is a bit premature because you know they may not end up um, level when the whole thing is put together. I might have to trim them slightly. But I've beveled off all the sides, all the edges, and made sure the saw marks have gone from the bottom. And I shall do that on this last one. I kept this one back. So block plane is probably the easiest to do it with, but if you don't have a block plane yet, but you have a bench plane like a number four or number five, you can do that as well. Uh, the key to it is tilting the mouth so that at no point can the actual throat of the plane fall down over the edge. So I put it at a diagonal. Like so. Be gentle on the end here because it's not particularly strong material, so you could break off the corner if you go straight across with any great force. So the block plane, you just seem to have a little bit more control. The lower angle I've got in here just takes the end grain really nicely. But I'm not going to overdo it because like I say I may need to trim uh, one of the legs when the whole thing's put together. So I did that. If I'd used um, completely plain all round material without the corners on there I would also just put a little round on the corners after I've done all the, the work on it. Just so that when you grab hold of it, and you're going to be carrying this thing around the workshop, you don't want sharp edges on there. And the other thing was the end of the top. So I'll just take that apart. Um, I've done the same thing on the end here and just taken a few shavings down the sides so that's nice and smooth and actually I have done both ends on this one so I cannot show you that there may be an end on the one that's glued up that I haven't done because I'm sure I left an end but there we go so we've got the top pretty much finished now certainly all the joinery finished we've got four legs we've got two stretchers we've done the joinery on the top, what I haven't shown you, what I did do earlier, uh, this is something I'm trying out. On the other one, I, I put a couple of dowels in. On this one, I put one dowel in. I don't think you need it, uh, but I'm trying it out because it helps with assembly. 
because you can appreciate when you're putting something in that's at an angle and it's only going in from one side what's going to stop it pushing apart when you try and put this gusset in which is like a wedge really so let's find the right well, that's the mortise that goes in so by putting something like a dowel in there that will stop it coming out in this direction so that, that just locks the joint together the alternative and what I think I'd probably recommend doing is um, trying to glue up the two leg assemblies with the gussets in them first as a, as a one assembly and then just putting it together but uh, I was trying different things out and I'll, I'll pop that in as an option in the uh, in the plans which by the way I have started doing and they should hopefully be ready by the next live stream if not before for those of you who'd like those right well I think that's probably it for this evening let's have a quick look at the chat see if I recognize anyone else in there and see if you've got any questions for me I would like to say um, a big thank you to Ray who in the last session was kind enough to make a donation and I didn't notice it until right at the end and I, I'm not sure whether he was still there. So who have we got? We've got um, Lego Man, hi. Debacker, hi. Peter's there, hi. Paul, hi Paul. Tom, hi Tom. Claudio, hi. Yeah, some very familiar faces. Thank you all for coming back. So Paul's popped his iron out of his coffin scrub plane. Wow. How's that going? Okay, so it looks as if you've, you've probably had answers to everything you were asking. I'll give you, I know there's a slight lag, so I'll give you... Uh, another minute or two just to get any questions in before I head off for a cup of tea and a donut. Has anyone got any questions on uh, Mitch's saw sharpening video? That could be a, something that they might have questions from. Yeah that's true, I don't know if you saw uh, the video I released early today, the saw sharpening one. I'll, uh, I'll try and put a link in here for you which is really going to test my technical knowledge and uh, check that out if you haven't seen it yet and if you've seen it you've got any questions you can ask me now rather than putting it in the comments i grabbed the link for you Mitch oh thanks for it so I've been hoping to do a, a saw sharpening video for uh, a few years since I did the last one I think and um, I've always whenever I've done one I've always thought oh I should have done something slightly differently shown it a bit better or, or included some more details and I'm sure exactly the same will be true about this one when I watch it in another few months or so or when people have asked some questions uh, but I, I think I've included more details here uh, I've got better pictures better um, diagrams and explanation of angles sounds complicated uh, but I think if you watch it you'll you should take away the fact that it's definitely worth trying and it's not that difficult to give it a go Tom's asking um, Dazuki uh, rip or cross cut my Dazuki I'm not sure exactly what he's asking. It's just uh, Q, Dazuki, Rip or Crosscut. Oh, when, when I was using...
Tom, if you're asking when I was using it, which side I was using, I've used both sides. I've probably got, I always forget the, the blooming names of these things. The Ryoba and the Dazuki. Always the Dazuki up. is the one with the back, it's the Japanese double. Ah, oh, that's right, yeah. Um, yeah, that is just the standard cross cut. Um, I can give you the number, that's a 240 and it's a 0.3 mil plate. It's a number S311. I, I do love the thin curve of a, of a Japanese saw, um, but I can't get on with them. The problem is you can't get a coping saw down the curve. <laughs> uh, well, the answer is that, get yourself a, a fret saw. Well, yeah, but they're not cheap. A good pretzel. Well, yeah, that's true. I use, I, I wouldn't say mine's a, a brilliant one, but it it's, does everything I wanted to do. Um, it's an Eclipse, and they, they call it a jeweler's saw. It takes fret saw blades, doesn't have a huge throat to it. And I usually just twist the end of the fret saw blade so that it's cutting off of square, uh, so that I can do take my dovetail waist out easily. I, I've got a Japanese, uh, sorry, not Japanese, uh, an Eclipse fret saw, but the uh, the uh, the throat is about a foot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got a couple of those. And it's, it's difficult to judge the tension with those, isn't it? Because you you squeeze it up and then then lock the blade off. Where do you get your saw files from? Paul's asking. Uh, Workshop Heaven was the last place I got one. I think you can get um, Axminster Tools have a good selection, I believe. Yeah, but I found that the Velorb saw files, they, the, uh, the teeth break off them really quickly, off the file. Ah. Which, yeah, that's the ones that I bought from uh, from Axminster before, and I didn't get on with them very well at all. I've got some Nicholson files, and I've got some Barco ones. They're a lot better. Yeah. I'll see if I can dig out mine to, to remind me the, the different brands I've got. And there's a, there is an argument, of course, that for your best sharpening, you want a new file every time. So if your teeth break off, well, by the time you've finished your saw, you should be onto a new one anyway. I don't... The, I, only, ones, the only ones that haven't had a teeth, teeth, tooth break off after about three or four sharpening are the Nicholson's. Nicholson's, did you say? Yeah. I've got some Nicholson... I think, they're, I think they're American, but they're really, really good. Yeah, American or Canadian, something like that. I've got um, one or two of their rasps and they're very good. They've definitely got a good name. I'm trying to read what these ones are because I, uh, I inherited some which I can't read the names on. And they're still, well, don't seem to have any broken teeth and they're reasonably old and well used. Let's try another pair of glasses. My splinter glasses. Uh, Byford, I think. That's a, I think that says Byford on it. We're probably going back 50 years for some of these, from guessing from who I inherited them from. And I think these are probably all Barco. My latest is Barco, 
Uh, they're made in Portugal, I think. This one here says it's Portugal. And I think the logo's different now. I'm not I one of these people. I think the Barker saw files are still made. They're not made in China. I think they're still made either in Europe or in America. Yeah, Portu America. Portugal, that's right. Portugal, that's it. They are made in Europe. But I have a feeling there's another brand in Portugal because... I think that's Oberg. Lego Man's just said that Oberg is basically Barco. Yeah, I was just about to say that because I've got one here which says Oberg and it's got the same logo as the Barco one. They must have been bought out and I'm sure I've got an Oberg file somewhere. Well, they might, may still use oh, the... They may, may have just bought the brand of one of them. So the same factory might make the same ones. So I think they're all um, either Oberg or Barco. Well, there's a different logo on this one. It looks like a pair of headphones. But uh, anyway, if you're breaking the teeth on them, they're either bad files or you're being too rough with them. Or you're using them on something harder than the file, which is unlikely. But yeah, certainly you have to look out for the cheap ones. Um, and, Tom, and says, Tom says that Barker is selling a lot of rebranded tools these days, uh, meaning that some tools are sold by Barco and other companies, and they just change the logos. That yeah. probably explains why Oberg sells the same file. Uh, no doubt. It's, it's certainly something that happens regularly in Sheffield and always has done. Uh, different brands of their own. Oh, this is my, you know, this is my saw. Um, and there'd be like five saw companies in Sheffield, uh, each of whom have their own branded saw, but actually they're all made by the same person in the same factory. And that still goes on today. And I actually wonder whether that's the case way back when we see all these um, ancient hand planes and how expensive certain brands are today or makers are today. I wonder if we actually knew for sure whether it was the same group of people making all the same planes. Interesting. Well, that is the case with Lu Ban, uh, who made Quang Sheng, Quiang Sheng, uh, Lu Ban, and they also make uh, Wood River. Yeah, uh, Axminster Rider, and they, I'm sure they probably make a few other brands around the world that we don't know of. Yep, absolutely. And the price differences are quite amazing. But I, I did hear that the although the same company is making those planes, uh, that they work to different specifications for some of the, the people that um, brand them as their own. So it doesn't mean to say that um, all coming out of the same factory will be to the same high specification or low specification. It's complicated, the tool world. I think it always has been. It, it probably has been since the first caveman, caveman sharpened a flint and started uh, shaving the skin off an animal. Well, folks, I'm going to leave you um, pondering whether saw files are used correctly or whether they're manufactured badly, um, whether there's one saw company in Sheffield making saws and half a dozen branding them as theirs, and whether or not Nicholson is American, Canadian, or something else over the Atlantic. Uh, I wish you all a very happy evening. And I hope to see you on the next stream. Thanks for joining me. Cheerio. Cheers, Mitch.